So Scott, let's get right into it. There was an article in the FT yesterday that caused quite a bit of stir. And I know that you had some thoughts on how it came across. So let's just clear that up. What exactly is happening with your office portfolio? We're very thoughtful about what the future of the workplace is. And we want to be intellectually honest with ourselves and look at our portfolio with you know clear eyes as to which are going to be really which buildings can be really competitive mm-hmm. in the post-pandemic world and which ones might be more challenged. And you know, and I made the analogy of Kodak, right? Which when mm-hmm. there was a time that you know when film was going out, they stepped investing in film, but the reality they should have been investing in digital. And that's right. what I've called this in my company, Project Kodak. Let's focus on what's digital and which are the few properties that might be film. And the ones that are film you know, we need to then look at differently and be more cautious about investing good money after bad. Mm-hmm. And as we've gone through that process, you know, we've narrowed this down um, to a handful of buildings that we think are in that film category. And so what do we do in that instance, right? So the first thing is, is there an alternative use um, that's not office? To make them work, you need to work with the lenders to get their approvals to be able to do that and inject a type of money type of capital that's required to uh, make those conversions come to life. You also need to obviously, in some cases, they are they qualify and they're pre-approved because they're in a district. In some cases, you need to go for a zoning change, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. so we're working through those processes. Um, I think you know in in the instances where they don't work, you know, I think our the, the point that uh, we made it to the FT was you know we're not going to continue to throw good money at bad if we can't sell them or make them work. We would just then work with the lenders that they take control of. Them, you, right? You'd walk away essentially, yeah. right? Right. But it was only these two. But what about what kind of conversations are you having portfolio wide? I know you have a roughly twenty billion dollar portfolio, one of the largest office landlords in New York City, which is you know the central business district where you have so much at stake, and you're actually investing even more through one seventy five Park and Five Times Square. What kind of conversations are you having, just broader portfolio wide? The liquidity. Um, in the lending market for office buildings mm-hmm. has, is, has definitely contracted, um, right? I mean, I think there's a, you know, and then there's a, an, a clear existential um, change happening about how people use office buildings. Um, and many lenders are painting every office building with the same brush. And, um, and you know, if you're a lender, you really don't want to go to credit committee with a New York City or any office building around the country if you could avoid it. You'd rather go multifamily, et cetera, because they're under much more scrutiny. So it, it, you really are at a point with the lenders that they're they're backing their best clients. Um, they're backing their the owners that are willing to invest new capital, additional capital into those buildings. And then they'll, they'll extend out loans or re- be part of the refinancing for those loans. So we did that, for example, at Five Times Square. Mm-hmm where we invested $300 million um, and we've got an extension. We've done that at Starrett Lehigh, where we, we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars and building out amenities and and uh, the tenant spaces and have gotten extensions on, on those. The ones that we have deemed digital that we think will be competitive, we're going to continue to support. A lack of liquidity, with that comes opportunity for you to start your own lending operation. So I believe you have about $2 billion earmarked for that, correct? Correct. Yes. How much... Have you started deploying some of that capital? Yeah, we did. We we invested two hundred and fifty million dollars at the end of last year, mm-hmm. and it's a good example that you know there was a a, a really high quality multifamily uh, a property in the Upper East Side that was being acquired by uh, you know well known um, operators. Are you talking about Gottlieb and the whole uh, the solo portfolio? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you. Okay, so that was yeah. a residential, right? And so you know, and, and there it had some good existing debt. Uh-huh. Which was agency debt was that was very low leverage. It was forty percent or so low leverage, but you know you, it, it was a, a large equity check that was required, mm-hmm. and so we came in and provided preferred equity uh, into that uh, example because there's just not a fluid market right now, right? I mean, what you're seeing is not only are banks being more constrained, but non-bank lenders that were active in the business are also more constrained than they had been before, um, and so. And and there's there's you no know, just be beyond office buildings, just even multifamily properties uh, that were under development or being acquired with a um, a underwriting assuming an interest rate regime that existed, you know, pre the big spike in interest rates. Mm-hmm. Um, don't pencil out when you put the new interest rate mix into them, right? And so that's where we 
can step in and help fill that void, either to provide new capital um, or provide um, the uh, additional capital if there's shortages. In this situation, you're able to actually make debt-like investments, but get equity-like returns. Mm -hmm. So it's great risk-adjusted returns. But that being said, you know where where LIBOR is or SOFR is right now. Um, you know, if you take SOFR and you add any reasonable spread, 300, 350 basis points, 400 basis points, your borrowers are paying 10% anyway, even for seniors loans mm-hmm. on construction loans, right? We have the ability to help underwrite um, construction risk, uh, evaluate, you know, capital projects. And so things that are a little bit more hairy and that enables that borrower also to bring in and give the comfort to the senior lender, right? Mm-hmm. Because they know that we've come in as well. So the goal is not to loan to own. Um, but but more of uh, underwrite some of the complexity that that exists there. Now we do uh, also have a, a strategy on the acquisition side that we've been very active on on buying um, pre TCO we call them you know mm-hmm. buildings that are under construction that aren't yet completed, usually merchant builders that have been delayed or costs have gone up, and their promote would be gone if they have to get through completion stabilization and then sell will come in and underwrite buying during construction and step in um and 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 pay at a price that they'll still be able to recognize or promote and we'll take the risk of completing yeah. construction uh or overseeing them completing construction we don't actually have to do it ourselves but just underwrite that completion and the lease up right and we've done that on a number of multifamily properties in Tampa and in Phoenix um in You're uh, not you're not quite the sponsor in that case you're more like a hand on the shoulder and right. and, 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 and we really acquire so was, and then and right. so we we we've actually will we will buy it and we'll let them recognize their gain and hold back money for completion we'll let them complete mm-hmm. and then we'll take uh and then and then when they're out they're out right and we'll give them the rest of their money so so but so that's that's another uh interesting area because as interest rates have gone up again first it was the pandemic right everything got delayed because of the pandemic which wiped out a lot of promotes if they had to wait through the process and these are merchant builders that plan on selling anyway and and then you know with the interest rate rise it's has again an interest and, and construction cost rising that also has impacted because people developers didn't uh you know account for having to put interest rate reserves or buy uh, the costs for um interest rate caps is that that have come up you know gone up almost 10 20 times than they originally forecasted so it's thrown their loans out of balance and so we can step in and resolve that either through the refinancing or acquiring midstream of construction. You have a lot of investors to answer to. Many of them are sovereigns and international investors. With all the perception of the office as kind of a damaged asset or even an existentially damaged asset, let's go that far. How how do they feel about kind of big projects that you're taking on, like 175 Park or or Five Times Square or 75 Park, where you're investing serious money back into these assets. So are there any questions or any kind of lack of clarity on that's turning into fear on part of investors? Like I'm not talking about the lenders now, I'm talking about your investors. Yeah, Mark, so. Sure. Yeah, I, listen, I think um, it, there's there's a process of communicating to investors which what differentiates one office building from another office building, right? So I think that the first thing is, you know, is when you have a quality asset like a 175 park um, that's, you know, unique or or the, the five times square is a star at Lehigh, you know, you have to really demonstrate why this is different in, mm-hmm. and going to be successful in that other, uh, when you get through this cycle. Um, and so, you know, that, I think if you can get that done, that goes a long way. That being said, there still are many investors that um, are, are, are pausing, right? Because there's uncertainty as to what the future of the office business is. So that creates less liquidity in the market than there normally will be, which also creates an opportunity, right? So we are ourselves, one of the investment strategies that we're focused on are where there are office buildings that we think are digital, right? That are those sponsors or those sponsors investors don't want to invest additional capital to um, release those buildings or or put in the amenities that's required. But we believe it would be successful on the other side and we can see the activity of the tenants that are looking at the space and uh, and the and the pricing and the debt structure will seek to invest that capital for those yep. investors take a preferred return and a share of the profits and we're working on a number of those transactions right now throughout Manhattan 
um, of, of buildings that we think will be ultimately successful on the other side. And, um, and so it works for us and we still give the older investors a participation in the upside mm -hmm. when we get through the, uh, the releasing. I just wonder what the, just on a more personal note, what the tenor of the conversations has become. We tend to be ahead of where the market's going, right? I mean, when we sold our company in 07, when we came back in, in August of 09, um, again, there was a lot of lack of clarity as to where the future of New York was, what the future of office was, what the future of the financial sector was. And so, you know, we had communicated a lot with our investors as to here's where we think the opportunity is. And we were investing while no one else was investing. We invested four and a half billion dollars from August of nine to into 2011 in office buildings and, you know, bought buildings like Starrett Lehigh for a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. We every year write a white paper where we spend a lot of time thinking through what's happening in the world, what's happening in our markets with our customers, um, what's happening politically, what's happening sort of you know, economically. And we spend, we talk to a lot of CEOs, public policy people, and this could be a 50 or 60 page paper. And from that paper, we then derive conviction as to what we want to do. And we say, this is where we think we're going to go. And this is how we're going to pivot our plans right, to address where that changing world is. And some is the change is our business plans on our operating properties. Mm -hmm. Some is how we're going to expand our business. And we then can start communicating that with our investors and saying, this is what we're thinking about. And sometimes it could take two or three years before we actually see the opportunities that fit within mm -hmm. the, the strategy we described. But by the time we actually see the opportunity, they realize that we're not just being reactionary. That It also ensures that we maintain discipline, right? So mm -hmm. it's in the real estate world, there's a lot of exciting deals that come in. Right. Our and mutual friend, Dror Poleg, wrote something for you. And there was one interesting trend, which was this consumerization of the office. So what happens when the office goes from somewhere you need to be to somewhere you, you kind of have to choose to be to make it work? This concept of thinking about the merger of work and home life and hospitality has been at the center of how we've approached the workplace for the last, I would say, almost 10 years, right? And I think that, and, and we continue to evolve it. And you did, you did have a really interesting deal. Unfortunately, it didn't come through, but the Airbnb deal that you were going to have, that was correct. really innovative and right. interesting. But... Trying to create, and, and we view sort of our, our, the whole concept is what's the glue that brings that together is a sense of community. And so there's that that includes amenities, right? So where are there places that people can go eat and and the health clubs? Um, and that also includes art and culture. And Is it fair to say that you were a little given how how much of a vested interest you have in the office market that you were a little late to this realization of hybrid work and what it might do to your business? I don't I don't think so. I think um, you know even going back to those days. Um, I, th I actually, I think we were communicating that we expect hybrid work is here to stay mm -hmm. and that what we should be doing is building tools so that um, the or the companies in our buildings can better manage hybrid work and ensure that when the people are in the office together, that they're um, they're getting the most out of being in the office, right? I mean, you, you when I used the word intentional before, this can't be people come in the office and they just sit in Zoom calls by right. themselves or Teams right. calls by themselves in their office, right? The if you had to choose, so we talked about this yesterday a little bit, there's been so many return to office, like here's why you should return. First, it was collaboration. Then I heard civic duty, like New Yorkers have a responsibility to come back. I've heard, hey, if you want to stand out in a recession, you need to come back to the office. I've heard as far as people go, as far as like, this is your patriotic duty to come back, right? If you had to pick one reason that the office is still essential, what would it be? Yeah, I, I I think there there were all those things have different stakeholders and rationales, but right. I still think the, the the real reason is um, to have a rich um, and and vibrant career and work life. Mm -hmm. You need personal engagement. Mm -hmm. You need community. You need mentorship. You need apprenticeship. Um, you need friendships. Right. You, you know. It's, so it is. It is, you know, it is what is a glue that brings a culture and a, and a community together to have personal interactions. I mean, it, it, to me, it wasn't a surprise that the great resignation was happening because the great resignation was Scott Reckler decides he wants to change his job. He changes his Zoom account, his email address, doesn't <laughs> yeah. change my commute, don't change right. my plant, don't go to my office and have to pack a box and say goodbye and people are crying and you're on your way. There's no connectivity. 
So, so it's, it's, it's sort of fundamental to, um, I think, you know, human uh, traits to have to have that connection. So that would be the, the most important thing. But I don't want to let go of the other points because they're, they're different points, right? On the civic duty piece is the civic duty piece is that we as social responsible, yeah. uh, you know, uh, individuals need to recognize that if we're not coming to our, our city centers, that, you know, there's going to be uh, challenges to the small business owners, the small restaurants, the service workers. There's a structural elements to our, our city ecosystem yep. and how our transit system is going to be funded, um, you know, how uh, restaurants and small businesses then that are in the CBDs are going to be able to survive on four days. Yep. So we have to be thoughtful about policy um, to address those because we're not going to solve those problems um without doing that and i think that's where when you think about trying to convert office buildings to residential and try to transform into those you know centers to 24 7 live work environments like we did in lower manhattan after 9 11 um is is a key is a key way to get that done you've been involved quite intimately both at the state and city level in a lot of these conversations. Um, so we have a couple of things that are happening now, right? Mayor Adams has proposed rezoning Midtown to allow for a lot more apartments. I believe yesterday, Governor Hochul came up with, a, she had floated this idea of a conversion tax break, right? For office yep. to resi conversions. Um, what else do you think needs to happen at government level to make some of these things viable? Because that is a massive opportunity. We are talking about a New York City that has suffered, you know, suffered a serious housing shortage, and we haven't really figured out how to make it work. This is an opportunity we have. There is an asset class, and think of 6th Avenue, 3rd Avenue, et cetera, that if things go well and we could reimagine these buildings, we would make a pretty big dent in our housing problem. So how are you thinking about that? What else do the kind of layers of government need to do? We need to streamline and provide certainty around the regulatory environment, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, the first thing is, if you don't, you, you can't have to go through ULERPs and years of uncertainty as to whether or not you're going to be able to convert a building or not convert a building. So having um, a, a regulatory framework that create as of right, uh, you know, uh, conversion opportunities, right. they meet certain guidelines, their buildings meet certain guidelines, location, age, whatever that might be, um, will provide a clear path for the private sector to say, okay, I can underwrite this and, and make a determination I can get this done. Economic like, a, like a builder's remedy of sorts for conversions, if, if you want to think about it in like a- yeah, or, 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 you know, I, I like to think about what happened in, in Midtown East rezoning, right? Uh -huh, Which they, uh -huh. they laid out the rules of 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 the game and mm. they said if, if 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 people investors want to come in developers want to come in take down old buildings and they invest a certain amount of money into infrastructure they get additional far you don't need to go to ulerp to go do it it's all free as a right and you see that's why you see a one variable that's why you see jp morgan that's why you see a 175 park and others that are being considered it sparked the 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 private sector um, to bring in its, its uh, innovation into and, and entrepreneurship to gain that done. So I think that would be a, a big factor combined with with um, creating tax incentives. And my big caution when I speak to policymakers is do not try to solve every problem, every other problem um, in lieu of the, of this one problem. Right? We have a problem right now. We need we have a housing shortage, and we have buildings that are going to be competitively obsolete that, that are great alternatives to convert to housing. The reality is to make that work, they have to be more than likely than not market rate housing. We also have an affordability problem, right? And we have affordability problem for low income housing and, and, and public housing. That's a separate problem. Mm -hmm. Let's solve that problem separately. Because if you try to solve this problem and say, okay, but X percent of it has to be low income, 60% of AMI, um, and it's got to be, by the way, it's got to be used. Uh, you have to use uh, union labor. We're never right. going to get it's, it's just not going to get done. And that's like California did that. And nothing gets built because of that. Right. So you're saying you don't say, don't impose more constraints on something that's already super complicated. Exactly. Right? Right. And, and I'm not saying it's not a problem, but let's solve that problem with other policies that are more suited for it. And let's solve this problem. You're aware, Scott, that I believe it was yesterday a report came out that Florida has now added more jobs than New York for the first time in four decades, right? A lot of the dynamism, a lot of the talent. So, it, you know, we could say, yes, New York is still New York and no one will ever argue that. But 
the momentum, the dynamism, kind of what is on the upswing has shifted to the sunshine state, right? And, yeah. and we invest, by the way, we're in Florida, we're in Arizona, we're in Denver, we're in Dallas, um, we're in North Carolina. So we're in those markets. And there is, and there's, to your point, there is, you know, from a, a, a developer standpoint, uh, the regulatory environment is much easier, right? It's a much, it's, it's, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's night and day, but the difference is, you know, there's trade-offs that you make when you come to New York, right? When you come to New York, you come to New York because there's no place that has much culture, much diversity, as much economic opportunity, as much ability to engage. The, the Delta, the, the Delta is shrinking though. No, it, but but again, if you think about the scale of places like Florida, Miami, it's not, you know, in terms of my, you know, think about the city, right? It's this, it's small, right? I'll say this, and you know, in, in 2000, uh, 2021, when everyone was running away from New York, we bought $2 billion of multifamily buildings when they were 80% occupied uh, at big discounts. And now they're 99% occupied and rents are above 2019 levels. So the positive side is people have spoken with their feet and come back and filled New York up, right? And, and the town pool has continued to be here, which gives me great confidence. But, so when it comes to 175 Park, I believe you're doing substantial hotel rooms there as well. You had a partnership that you were trying to get done with Airbnb at 75 Rock. And that brings to me to one broader thing that I think about quite a bit, which is this blurring of asset classes, right? You used to have pure play office buildings, then you had multifamily, and then you had hotels, and there were very cleanly designated assets, right? So they're financed a certain way, they're developed a certain way, they're marketed a certain way. The next iteration of buildings is kind of, when you talk about live, work, play, it's actually going to be in one building in many cases, as opposed to a broader community. So how are you thinking about that? Yeah. And as you mentioned, like with 75 Rock was another example mm -hmm. where I, I see, as I said, this blurring between home and work life, right? That you're part of a community. And I could say the same thing in our multifamily residences, right? That we have, we're building workplaces in our multifamily uh, flexible workplaces and meeting places. And, and so we're blurring that as well in, on both sides of the equation. And I, and I think that, um, you know, that's the, in the future iterations of those of buildings are going to be set up more like that. Now, that doesn't have to always be in one building, but you're, that's the point about even clustering around mm -hmm. the, the neighborhoods that those buildings are, are in, that people could live closer to work a lot. Uh, how do you put the packages together, the loan packages together for an asset like that? How do you structure the equity, et cetera? Because I'm assuming it's like one whole new layer of complication. Yeah. So um, th there's generally, to your point, you have to underwrite each use separately okay. and, and bring it in, uh, you know, and then consolidate it for the financing. In some cases, we've, we've developed programs where you can actually condo and finance each part separately. And we've looked at that and, and we're looking at that, frankly, in some of our conversion opportunities where we're doing mixed use that maybe you can take the multifamily and that's a separate, um, uh, you know, condo within the, con within the building. So the way that, that people used to do for signage in, uh, in Times Square, right? Right. And even that when we did, you know, five Times Square as an example, we've broken that up legally into three different condos so that if we wanted to condo off the retail, we could, we wanted to condo off the mid block and the top of the building, we could, we, when we were looking at 75 Rock, we considered doing that as well. My, my last question, and, and this goes back to a tenant that you actually know very well, Google, right? Google had this hyper growth in, in the pandemic, ended up adding, I want to say, between 50 and 75,000 workers. And now they've, they've made some very, very significant layoffs. And I think Google and Microsoft and many others are just finding it's not they're not going to have to come back to those levels of workers and workforce again. That's obviously going to impact the office market in a very big way, right? So it's not it's not that they're not growing. Google had a tremendous quarter. They made a huge profit last quarter, but they realized that they can probably do this with 10% fewer people, right? That's going to start playing out in the markets that you're in. So when you think about macro trends and you think about AI and replacing lower level workers and and tech companies trying to figure out how to streamline. So when you think about that and you scale it out or you kind of look at 100 companies or 10,000 companies, that's a pretty interesting dilemma for the office market. And so it, you, 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 let's unpack what you said a little bit because there's okay. two points I think within there that are worth noting and separating, right? One is um, your point about the, the, the level of growth that, that, that Google's and the other tech companies have done from 2019 on. And I, I think 
that's really the, a, a was a pandemic demand surge, right? And and that was the tech companies, you know, played into that. The retail companies did in terms of buying inventories, and if you and and the investment banks in terms of transactions. And there's going to be a reversion back to 2019 trend lines. And and I've looked at a lot of these different companies in terms of where their expectations are. The same with the investment banks. And you know, it's almost like we had a a 21, 22 fantasy land of all the surge of demand coming out of, of COVID that was nice to have, but it's not, it's not sustainable. And now we got to go back to our normal trend. So we're going back to 19. What's that mean for offices? I don't think we ever underwrote in our business that we were going to have that surge of, you know, uh, what we saw in 21, 22. And so, you know, if we get back to 19 and then start growing from there, I think that will be, uh, will be fine. It's not going to come without some pain. 